Hi, Chip. Thank you for coming Thank to you. the Unhustle podcast. It's, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, let's just jump right into it. And why don't you take us from your flatline experience backwards a little bit, give our audience uh, a little bit of an overview of your life. Sure. Uh, so I went to college and, and graduate business school at Stanford. And uh, I graduated when I was very young um, and worked for a real estate developer. And then also when I was very, really young, I decided to start a boutique hotel company, one of the first in the US. Um, that was when I was 25. The hotel, first hotel I bought at, when I was 26. The company's name was Joie de Vivre and means French for joy of life. And that was our mission statement is to create joy. And so uh, for the next 24 years, I ran that company. But in my mid 40s, I started to see that I didn't want to do it anymore. So I'd been doing it for over 20 years at that point. Um, I was, I'd written books and I was giving speeches and I was enjoying that. And I could feel just how much responsibility was weighing down on me. I started the company based upon creativity and freedom. That's what I was looking for. But, you know, when we had 3,500 employees and 52 boutique hotels and we were growing very quickly, I didn't feel a lot of creativity or freedom anymore. It was about that time that the Great Recession came along um, and a bunch of other stuff that, that went wrong. There's just everything that could go wrong went wrong in my life. And that was capped by the fact that um, in August of 2008, soon after uh, one of my best friends committed suicide, um, I had a flatline experience. And I was giving a speech in St. Louis, Missouri. And um, I, I say St. Louis, Missouri, uh, misery, because I was in misery. <laughs> uh, and I, get, I, I was signing books after the speech on stage and I, I went flatline. And um, what was happening was I had a, a broken ankle, um, which we knew about. Uh, I was on crutches and I had a bacterial infection in my leg because I had a cut on my leg from the injury. Um, and so I was on a very strong antibiotic. So I was probably, they still don't know what happened, but it seems as if I had an allergic reaction to oh, the wow. antibiotic. But that really woke me up because in many ways, I wasn't happy with where my life was. And sometimes your body actually teaches you things. And my body sort of told me, hey, this isn't working. And so over the next two years after that, I decided in the bottom of the recession to sell my company um, and start new. And that wasn't easy to do. I had a lot. Um, it was a stupid thing from a financial perspective, um, but it was what I needed to do. And I had no idea what I was going to do next. But what it did is it helped me to have the freedom and the creativity again which is what I was originally looking for at age 26 mm -hmm. to plan what's next for me. And so of course that was the flatline experience was 11 years ago. And since then a lot of, th I've done a lot of other things. Right. Right. Yeah. You uh, got involved with Airbnb and now you're leading the modern elder in uh, modern elder Academy. Yep. Modern Elder Academy. Is it in Todos Santos or is it in Pescadero? It's in Pescadero. So it's right next to Todos Santos. Um, for those who don't know, uh, you know, we, we, Melina and I know this area very well, we're, but we're, we're basically about uh, an hour north of Cabo San Lucas in the southern part of the Baja uh, California Sur Peninsula. Um, so we are in Mexico, um, but really quite accessible from all over because Cabo San Lucas is a pretty big airport. Very accessible. Very yeah. quick flight from, uh, yeah, from California, oh, from anywhere. For anywhere. So um, we've had 500 alums now from 17 countries. Uh, and the program, let me take, let's go back to Airbnb for a moment. The program was created based upon my experience at Airbnb. So I decided to write a book. This is my fifth book called Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder after I moved from full-time to just a strategic advisor to the company. While I was writing that book, what I noticed is that a lot of people in midlife, and I used to define midlife as 45 to 65, I now define it as 35 to 75. <laughs> it happens, starts earlier and it goes longer, it's a marathon. Um, what I came to realize is that if we're gonna live longer, which is, there's some accuracy. Which we are. Mm -hmm. And power seems to be moving younger, because of our growing need and desire for digital intelligence or, or DQ, 
and therefore young, younger people are perceived as being better at that. So we're gonna live longer, power's moving younger, and the world is changing faster. Those three ingredients have created a situation where a lot of people in midlife are feeling irrelevant and confused. And so I decided I would create the world's first midlife wisdom school because we really don't have any schools or tools for people in midlife to imagine how to press the reset button. And so, um, so that's what I did. And uh, we did a beta program the first half of 2018. Uh, and I, we used my book, Wisdom at Work, as sort of the, the model for the program. Got a lot of great feedback. Um, and then we opened to the public uh, starting last November uh, and have now been open for one season and we're about to open our second season. Um, what's been phenomenal is just the response of our, our students, which has been off the charts positive. And they really feel like there's a, a, a real desperate need for people to have almost like a rite of passage in midlife to help them understand how to remake themselves. Because the people who actually struggle the most are those who are not changing. And mm. if you're not changing, you know, what happens is you end up feeling more and more stale, almost like, you know, a, a piece of celery in, right. you know, <laughs> in the store that should have been actually taken, <laughs> taken off the shelves. Yeah. 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 So, um, Chip, I saw somewhere that it's your vision for that company to have at least 100 campuses worldwide. Is that still the case or have you changed? Um, definitely. So, so, yeah, that's not exactly accurate. So I don't want the Modern Elder Academy to have 100 dots on the map around the world. What I want the Modern Elder Academy to do is to catalyze other people to create their own version of a midlife wisdom school. So there might only be two or okay. three, 10 years from now, there might only be two or three midlife, or two or three modern elder academies, but there might be a hundred midlife wisdom schools. So I'm lucky enough to have been on the board of the Esalen Institute um, in Big Sur, California for a long time. I've been a teacher there as well. And they only have one campus, but in 1962 when they started, but within 10 years, there were over a hundred personal growth retreat centers around the U.S., we're not a personal growth retreat center. We are a midlife wisdom school. The difference is we have a curriculum, we have a 150 page workbook, and the focus is specific on a, a particular age in life. Whereas, you know, we're, we're a facility and a facilitator. Esalen is purely a facility and mm -hmm. people come there and teach whatever they're gonna teach. Uh, uh, so that's the difference, but, but I think that's a model for me to say, wow, how, how could one place catalyze people to create their own version of it right right excellent thank you for clarifying that i think i saw it somewhere on your website um you you refer to yourself as a rebel mm -hmm. and an optimist and i want to tap a little bit talk a little bit about um, values and how values define what you do in life do for, for work uh, maybe you can share some of your values um, just to have a bit sure. of a values conversation. Um, you know, I think that one of the first pieces of evidence of my values was when I was graduating from Stanford Business School. I'd worked for Morgan Stanley the prior summer, and I realized I didn't want to work in a big investment bank. I wanted to work in a local community where the real estate development I was doing was having an impact locally, and I could feel that that. So there was that decision and I, I took a job that paid me one third as much as Morgan Stanley was gonna pay me after graduation. So a value was I wanna do something that has a purpose and feels like it's meaningful as opposed to focusing on money. And then two and a half years later, I decided to start a boutique hotel company because I wanted to do something that was more creative. But I also love the idea that you know the company's name, Joie de Vivre, was also our mission statement. I love that name, by the way. Um, let me just, just pause you there just for a second and um, tell you how I went on a quest of looking into everything and anything that had to do with that name because I, uh, I, um, a dear, dear good friend of mine uh, passed away at the age, right, a few days before he hit 
50. And he was, and he was French and he was um, literally bigger than life. And so when that happened, I started looking into Jure de Vivre and there's a, a bunch of books all written about it. I, I wanted to call my company that, but you've already taken it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm very familiar with that concept, but yes, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, to be honest with you, in the, in the United States, it was not the most practical name. People didn't know what it meant, how to spell it or how to say it. Right. <laughs> But at the same time, it was also our mission statement, creating joy. Right. And so the idea that a mission, very few companies in the world have a mission statement that's the, same, the name of their company. And so um, in many ways, that was my values on display is to say, I, you know, I want my values to be in, in the name of the company. Um, then we created, you know, 52 boutique hotels, all in California, all of them local. Again, I wanted to touch and feel them. I didn't want to have dots on the map all over the world because I wanted to really have these hotels be sort of soulful expressions of their community. Um, I also wanted to make sure that we evaluated the effectiveness of our general managers of the hotels based upon how much money they gave away, which is so weird. It was really based upon how much they were doing in their local communities so that the hotel could be perceived as an extension uh, or a positive extension of the community. So well, that's a good way to measure that value. If that was, that mm -hmm. was the value of the company, that's a we, good way to do we, it. We did. And so, so a, a general manager would be evaluated on employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction, profitability, uh, net income, and philanthropy. Right. So philanthropy was a, one of the things that we actually evaluated. So um, long story short is I think my values. And then of course at Airbnb, I was I helpful with the company crafting the, the term belong anywhere. That's sort of our, our mission at, at Airbnb. That's something that we, we worked on as soon as I joined. Um, so helping people to have a sense of belonging to, in a world that is more and more fractious and you know, sort of like sometimes feeling tribal in some way was really important to me and Airbnb was part of that. And then you know, the, the idea of giving back uh, and, and have the, having the Modern Elder Academy be a social enterprise where I don't pay myself at all I built the campus. Don't get any, you know, don't get paid anything for that. You surf. So it, it's I surf. I surf <laughs> and I surf. There you go. <laughs> so I surf and I surf. Yeah. Actually, hopefully I, I, I surf better than I surf. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, thank you for that. Another thing I picked up um, in one of your books, I believe, um, was um, the concept of Koroshi, Death mm. by Overworked. Yes. Which is, um, which is very, very dear to uh, what Unhustle is doing and, and preventing burnout. So can you um, speak a little bit um, how, what you do to prevent burnout or used to do to prevent burnout or are you still stressed out? I, I still, I still have to focus on it. Um, I know you so, meditate. I know I, you do I, yoga. I, yes, I do. I'm, I'm actually pretty good at meditation. I'm not very good at yoga. Um, so I don't know why Med meditation just comes naturally to me. I really enjoy it. I, um, and I've been doing it for years. I, I love doing Vipassana silent meditation retreats. Mm -hmm. Did one in the sea of Cortez in Loretto Bay. Uh, I heard with that with the whales. Mark Coleman with the whales, and it was a, it was a week long um, experience where we were basically paddling from uh, on, in kayaks from island to island and and meditating silently for a week. It was beautiful. But you guys didn't speak at all for the whole week. Um, we did. We other than once a day when we actually would have a, a dharma talk from Mark, and then we could ask questions. That was it. You couldn't even say, "Wow, look at that whale." No, no. No. Beautiful. <laughs> I know. It really, it, it forced us to contain all that energy. Um, so what else do I do? I like to exercise. So I, you know, exercise is another thing that helps me, whether it's swimming, running on the beach, et cetera. Um, so I would just say that uh, I actually think one of the best ways to sort of help to address this is to have a multifaceted life. One of the things I've seen from entrepreneurs and especially people who are younger who are somewhat obsessive about being successful is that they tend to actually create a life that's quite one dimensional. Mm -hmm. And actually, frankly, one of my challenges at Airbnb when I joined was, so I, I was, I agreed to do it as long as it was 15 hours a week. And about three weeks into it, I said to Brian, the CEO of the company who is 21 years younger than me, Brian, this is nuts. This is 15 hours a day, not 15 hours a week. 
And he looked at me like, of course, what'd you expect? I said, yeah. well, I, <laughs> I expected it was supposed to be 15 hours a week for me because that was our understanding. <laughs> but he sort of said, listen, it's a startup. What do, you, what do you expect? And what I saw over and over again in the company is there are a lot of young people who would, in essence, um, monopolize their time and their life with respect to their career and their company. Mm-hmm. And this is actually, this could be very detrimental. Um, during the dot-com bust, my, one of my friends, Chip, uh, committed suicide. I mentioned that earlier. But I actually had four other friends commit suicide as well. Five friends, wow. all, all men between 42 and 52, who frankly saw their businesses falling apart in the recession. And because their own sense of self-esteem and identity was so attached to their success of their business, when their business fell apart, uh, the economic depression created a personal depression and led to them actually committing suicide. Yeah, part of the reason I wanted to create the academy was to help people to understand midlife doesn't have to be awful. Uh, and there are, midlife is really the time of life where the primary operating system of your life starts to shift from your ego to your soul. And mm-hmm. it's, it's a period of time <laughs> where you're really able to start understanding the world in new ways that you hadn't actually, you haven't uh, explored before. Yeah, and I'm seeing that with myself. I mean, I'm 48 years old, so I'm probably prime candidate for your academy. Mm-hmm. And Come on def- over. Uh, definitely, we need to talk. We uh, have scholarships, you know, as well. So, you, you know, you can pay full tuition or there's three levels of scholarship. There you go. No, we'll, for sure, we'll talk. Uh, I'm absolutely interested in at least coming and checking it out, uh, possibly bringing a non-hustle retreat with you. I, I don't know exactly. Um, mm-hmm. I think you guys maybe have your own program already, but we'll definitely talk We do have talk weeks more. where pri- private groups come and, and, and met. Excellent. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm definitely sh- seeing that shift from um, from ego to soul and how that affects everything that I've done. I mean, I used to do 20 years of digital marketing, worked with, with amazing brands around the world and had a seven figure business and said, you know what, it's not what I want to do. It's, it's, mm-hmm. there's more to life and, and, and for me to give back to society and, and started on hustle. So I definitely see that point with you. How do you define success for yourself then? I mean, I think at this point, you know, I've, I've defined it in various ways along the way. I've, I've actually never defined it money, my, money-wise, which is weird. Um, it's never been a high priority for me. Um, so the way I've currently defined it is how am I affecting other people, whether it's as me- a mentor to people or whether it's with the Modern Elder Academy helping to teach people uh, a new way of life um, and how are we helping them transform their lives or how does the Modern Elder Academy as a social enterprise catalyze other people to create their version of a midlife wisdom school. So, um, so I, what I have to be careful of, so I never, so money has not been a big issue for me. What I have to be careful of is fame or yeah, getting my name in the headlines kind of thing. Uh, that's where that definition of success can be quite alluring for me. Mm-hmm. It can actually sort of like, uh, sort of try to, try to entice me mm-hmm. a- and why I have to be careful about that is because that is not necessarily in the long run what really matters to me but in the short run I love seeing my name in the New York Times or I love seeing that you know I've been asked to give a TED talk and then you know I'm on you know on the TED st- website so so I you know it's the good news is if you can actually understand your shadow you know, what is the thing that actually you have to be careful of? It helps you to monitor yourself a little bit better. I saw that, um, I saw that you go to Burning Man, which um, I used to go. We went for years and years and got really full on into it. Um, but to me, Burning Man offered that experience um, of, of letting go of everything else. I actually used to go there and shut my phone off this before you could actually connect. Yes. And... Uh, and I used to love it because I would just go there and meditate. And, and I used to sleep there a lot <laughs> and catch up on sleep, which people... That's people, so strange. I yes. It's so bizarre. <laughs> but because I was finally disconnected and I knew I couldn't do anything about work, I had some of the best sleep. At <laughs> <laughs> it, is tr- it is true, actually. I, I have had some really great sleeps there. I don't sleep during the day very easily, but gosh, could I sleep during the day there? <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> so, <clears throat> so to me, uh, again, and, and I'm sure you see it with Mexico, um, putting yourself in a different perspective, whether you're traveling, you know, with Airbnb, switching places, to me, kind of helps um, reestablish who you are as an individual when you get out of that, that rituals and the comfort zone and, and everything that you're used to. So um, Burning Man <laughs> definitely provides that experience. Yes. Um, what's the scariest thing you've done in your life? Mm -hmm. The scariest thing I've done in my life? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I mean, I you know, I've jumped from cliffs into a a lake that were like a hundred feet high, so it's like uh -huh. ten stories. That's a, you know, that could be dangerous. Um, I did that. I, it was at a place where I knew that the bottom of the lake was pretty deep, so it was really just a matter of okay, you know is a hundred feet too far to, to jump uh, to, you know, in terms of what would happen if I accidentally right. hit bottom. <laughs> hit, well, not so much hit bottom, but actually what if I just didn't enter the water properly? What yeah. could I break some bones? Um, I don't think I'd do that again. I did that 30 years ago. Um, I don't know. Some of the scariest things are to say, I love you first to someone else for the first time. Mm. Uh, when you don't know where they're at. So I don't know. Uh, to me, um, yeah, I think more and more the scary things are almost internal. Yeah, and the reason I'm asking you is because uh, and you, you probably see that with your students as well. Some people are, are not open to change, and it's scary to, to go through that change and, and through mm -hmm. that transformation. And so um, how do you how do you inspire somebody to, 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 to change their mindset, to shift their perspective and to say there's a different way? Well, or a new it, case even to, to, you know, to sell your company. And I'm so happy you didn't go there and you talked oh, yeah. about jumping in the lake instead. Because yeah, and yeah jump, not jumping off the bridge. It, uh, you know, so I think the thing that's interesting is, you know, at, at Modern Elder Academy, one of the things I like to say is, if you don't like change, you'll like irrelevancy even less. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> and um, so change can be scary, but, but, but what we have to help people understand is that there's a word, it's called liminal. And liminality is, means you're in transition. And, and it is actually true of your whole life. People vastly underestimate how much of their life will change in the next 10 years. There's a beautiful TED Talk by Dan Gilbert about that. And so helping people to understand how much liminality or transition is a part of life is really fundamental to what we teach at the Modern Elder Academy. Thank you so much. I know you have another interview you have to jump on. Yes. Um, so I'd love to talk to you more, but uh, let's, uh, let's wrap it Come up. Come visit. Come visit. Absolutely. Um, uh, I would reach out to you. Um, we'll be there in January and we'll connect okay. in person and uh, you can take me surfing and, and show me some moves. Perfect. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Chip. Great. Look forward, look forward to seeing it. All right. Bye-bye.